to say a few words about it. the guy who really inspires not only the Dialogue Institute, but uh, a range of other institutions across the country and world who uh, in turn is responsible for the kind of adventure you're going to experience this evening. His name is Fethullah Gülen. He's a contemporary Turkish philosopher who writes on politics and social issues, but above all on religion, particularly mysticism. He is an expert in Sufism. Most of us who know him and know his work would call him a Sufi. He would say, I'm not. I would say he is. He's not here to defend himself, so he is a Sufi. <laughs> and he has inspired a movement that has uh, involved literally millions of people, first in Turkey and then around the world, toward what he calls hizmet, which is service, altruistic service. The movement is called the hizmet movement, and his idea is that altruistic service is what in Turkish is called an ibida, a duty. It's not something you do to get paid for. You do because you derive satisfaction and because it connects you to other people and to God. You find the good in everyone, hoşguru, another Turkish word, hoş means good, and guru comes from a root meaning to see. So you embrace others as you search your own soul for improvement. Your words lead to actions. Your actions lead to, in this case, the founding of schools from elementary to university in 170 countries, from Turkey to Nigeria to the United States, and other things you heard about a few moments ago, hospitals, social services, conference, conferences, concerts, such as this evening's dinners, dialogues, dialogues of a whole that involve different people of different traditions, of different cultures, different religions. And you then, in turn, who inspires the Hizmet movement, is inspired by Mehdeva, Mevlana Rumi, a 13th century poet and mystic. Born in 1207 in Balkhi, what is now Afghanistan, during the period of the Mongol invasions that would bring to an end eventually the Abbasid Caliphate, he grew up and lived in a world, the 13th century, of enormous violence and strife. It's the period, the tail end of the Crusade, it's the period of violence between Christians and Muslims, within the Muslim world, within the Christian world, across the Mediterranean. His own mother was killed in Balkh by the Mongols, at least that is the tradition. And he and his father went throughout the region. They went on Hajj, which, as many of you may know, the season for which just ended today for Muslims, went to Mecca, and ended up in Konya, in south-central Turkey, it was the capital that had been established by the Seljuks, known as the Seljuks of Rum. So he's called, therefore, Rumi by the Turks. The Persians and the Afghanis called him Balkhi because he came from Balkh. You have your choice. But Ruby is the name by which he has become world-renowned. He was himself a devout Muslim, a master of Sharia, of Islamic law, as his father was. And in fact, when they arrived in Konya, that's eventually what he came to be doing, teaching law. Until one day, this fellow by the name of Shams from Tabriz, Shams Tabrizi, walked into his classroom and posed the question to him, who is greater? Muhammad, the seal of the prophets, the ultimate prophet, or the Turkish mystic, Bayezid Bistani, who said, how great is my glory? How great is my glory? Suggesting that Bistani had become filled, so filled with God that he could no longer distinguish himself from God. So when he said, how great is my glory, he wasn't, of course, speaking of himself, but of God speaking out of him, through him. Muhammad never said something like that, and yet Muhammad is Muhammad. And this so threw Rumi off his game that he began to rethink his whole life and wonder and worry whether Sharia and law were really what it was all about or whether there was not something more, some way to connect to God that was deeper, and began to, pr to pursue mysticism as a private way of life and something that he taught. The word Sufism comes from the Arabic word Suf meaning wool. So the idea for the Sufi is that one envelops oneself in a very plain kind of garment. I like to call it a plain brown wrapper. To suggest that one is not connected to and concerned with the world and its material worries and wearing the right clothes and going to vineyard vines to get your stuff, but rather plain, simple clothing. And Ruby not only became a master of mysticism, a Sufi par excellence, 
but a writer of poetry that went on and on, and three different individuals recorded what he wrote. One of his sets of words reads like this, not Christian or Jew or Muslim or Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I am not from the East or the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist. I'm not an entity in this world or the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body nor soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one called to a no, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath breathing human being. These are words that are extraordinarily universalistic, not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion, and they are the words being spoken through the poet by God itself, as it were. And there's an inherent logic to the words coming through the poet. He is, after all, a mystic. A mystic seeks oneness with God, seeks to be filled with God, seeks to be filled with God's hiddenmost, innermost recess, the mysterion, from a Greek verb, mystein. By the way, you will be tested on this vocabulary afterwards. You'll mention it. Mystein means in Greek to close and by extension to hide. So the mysterion is the hiddenmost, deepest, most recess of God. The mystic wants to be filled with that. Well, in order to be filled with that, you need to be emptied of oneself, and therefore empty of ego. There's a paradox, of course. God doesn't have inner and outer, up, down, lower, upper, east, west, north, south. God is placeless, spaceless, a trace of the traceless. And the challenge, therefore, for the mystic in seeking the mysterial is not only to figure out how to access it, but having done so, having let one's ego completely go, oneself go to be filled with God, to gain oneself to come back from the experience, to be able to communicate with people. There was a Sufi by the name of Mansur al-Halaj from a group known as the intoxicated Sufi, so filled with the wine of divine love were they that they were just madly and without making much sense to outsiders. And Mansur al-Halaj came back from the experience of ecstasis being outside himself and wasn't able fully to come back within. So he started yelling, Anna al-Haq, Anna al-Haq, I am the truth, I am the truth. And al-Haq, the truth, is one of the names of God. I am God, I am God. He was executed, of course, as an apostate, as a heretic. The danger of the mystical experience is death, its madness, its apostasy, or all of the above. The rewards, of course, are profound. To achieve oneness with the one, to find the mystery, to be fully filled with God, to return to the source from which we come, is extraordinary. The challenge to begin with, to empty oneself. One's goal is not to be enlightened. One's goal is to be enlightened so that one can return and help the community around one. Because if one's goal is to be enlightened, that's too selfish. That's too ego-bound. One must be empty of self. So Rumi is a consummate mystic. He is devoid of ego. He's devoid of politics and power struggles of his era. The notion that mind is the only path to God. And again and again, in his work, the Mesnavi, he expresses these ideas of universality, of emptying oneself of self. Inside this new love, die. Your way begins on the other side. Become the sky. Take an axe to the prison wall. Escape. Walk out like someone suddenly born into color. Do it now. You're covered with thick cloud. Slide out the side. Die and be quiet. Quietness is the surest sign that you've died. Your old life was a frantic running from silence. The speechless full moon comes out now. Empty oneself of self. The old you who was must die, and of course, a new you is born. That's the reward that one gets from that. He writes, Death will take it all away soon enough. 
All night, therefore, listen to the conversation. Stay up. Listen to all there is. Every holy person seems to have a different doctrine and practice, but there's really only one word. And he writes a wonderful tale about Moses, who heard a shepherd on the road pray. Ruby writes, God, where are you? I want to help you. I want to fix your shoes and comb your hair. I want to wash your clothes and pick the lice off. I want to bring you milk and kiss your little hands and feet when it's time for you to go to bed. I want to sweep out your room and keep it neat. God, my sheep and goats are yours. All I can say remembering you is I and ah. Moses could stand it no longer. Who are you talking to? The one who made us and made the earth and made the sky. Don't talk about shoes and socks with God. And what's this with your little hands and feet? Such blasphemous familiarity sounds like you're chatting with your uncles. A sudden revelation came then to Moses. God's voice. You have separated me from one of my own. Did you come as a prophet to unite or to sever? I'm a part of all of this divisiveness. Ways of worshiping are not to be ranked as better or worse than one another. The love religion has no code or doctrine. Only God. So the ruby has nothing engraved on it. It doesn't need markings. God began speaking deeper mysteries to Moses. Vision and words which cannot be recorded here. Of course they can't. They are ineffable. How can the words Moses heard be recorded here? Poured into and through him. He let himself, left himself and came back. Stasis being outside oneself. He went to eternity and came back here. He came back here and realized, Moses says, I was wrong. God has revealed to me that there are no rules for worship. Say whatever and however your loving tells you to. Your sweet blasphemy is the truest devotion. Through you, a whole world is free. So Rumi understood and Rumi taught and Rumi wrote about how diverse, infinitely diverse, the ways of accessing God in the mysterium can be. And eventually, over the course of time, as he preached, his preaching changed style, he felt the need to kind of move around a lot, and he was dancing around a lot, and lost a lot of students that way. They thought he was maybe going over the edge. But he gained students as well. And over time, his poetry began also even more deeply to reflect the ideas that were burgeoning within him about the relationship between God and ourselves as a relationship between the beloved and the lover, whereby we are the beloved and God is the lover, and we are the lover and God is the beloved, and we cannot distinguish the one from the other or the love between them, Mahaba. The waking lover speaks directly to the beloved. You are the sky my spirit circles in. The love inside love, the resurrection place. I have five things to say. Five fingers to give into your grace. First, when I was apart from you, this world did not exist nor any other. Second, whatever I was looking for was always you. Third, why did I ever learn to count to three? Fourth, my cornfield is burning. Fifth, the finger stands for Rabia, this fifth finger. This is for someone else. Is there a difference? Are these words or tears? Is weeping speech? What shall I do, my love? So he speaks, and everyone around begins to cry with him, laughing crazily, moaning in the spreading union of lover and beloved. This is the true religion. All others are thrown away bandages beside it. This is the Sema of slavery and mastery dancing together. This is not the Neither words nor any natural fact can express this. I know, I know these dancers. And so in this poem, he references Rabia, the first Sufi, a woman who changed the direction of Muslim mysticism, of Sufism, from awe for God to love for God, from fear to love. He gives us five things like the five pillars of Islam like the five prayer times of Islam, like the five books of the Torah, 
for Judaism, like the five wounds in Christ's body for Christianity. It is one and the same time a universal preaching and a wonderful teaching. This is the Sema of slavery and mastery. Over the course of time, Rumi's patterns of dancing as he spoke poetry, speaking poetry that sought the mysterium, caught on and became a more formalized movement. Every Sufi begins the process of engaging God with what's called dhikr in Arabic, from the word remember, remembering God that is all around you. Every Sufi has as a goal, fana, the complete dissipation of self into God, from which one, of course, must return. And the specifics of the beginning point is called sema, from a root meaning hearing, to hear God. But the Sufis dance, they don't sing, they don't speak. The tariqa, the particular path of Rumi, became a dancing path, formalized over the course of time, one hand up and one down, spinning like the universe, spinning like the earth on its axis, spinning like planets around the sun, but there is no sun in the center. It simply place this place, trace this trace, spinning one hand pointing up, one hand pointing down. Each Sufi, each dervish, becomes a connector between heaven and earth. Wearing a high hat, a teka that is designed to look like a gravestone, and a robe that is designed to appear like a shroud, so that one is, as it were, preparing to return whence one came. Death not as a negative, but as a positive, becoming one with God. Heads lolling to the side, as if in death, arms across the chest at the outset before they get spread out, as if lying in one's death, but also emphasizing the heart, the head lolling at 23 and a half degrees, exactly the degrees to which the earth lolls on its side. Perhaps that's why one doesn't get dizzy as one's eyes are closed and one spins and spins and spins, finding a way back. Music sometimes, as we will have privilege to hear this evening, including the net, the instrument on the end, which is a reed, a reed flute, and, and Rumi writes about the reed cut from the riverbed that longs to come back to the riverbed, to its source. It becomes then a symbol of the soul. It becomes then part of the symbolism of nature all around us being part of that which God has made, founding, finding the one God in everything. Heno, one, theos, God, pan, everything. Pan, henotheism is what Rumi teaches. Pan, henotheism is what the dervishes dance, it's what the Hizmet movement is all about. In your light, I learn how to love. In your beauty, how to make poems. You dance inside my chest where no one sees you, but sometimes I do, and that sight becomes this art. Enjoy it all. <laughs>